happy birthday, Imago Day. Tonight, February 2021, is our third birthday. And I think that is something to celebrate. Um, just by show of hands, how many people were here for our very first Imago Day, which had been in February 2018. Could you raise your hand? Wow, wow, that's amazing. So we have journeyed this together wherever you might have found yourself um, coming on this Imago Day journey. It has been a journey. And so um, I'm just so excited that you're here tonight. I want to wish you a happy Valentine's Day. I hope you had a wonderful time out there. And I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to um, take an offering in just the next few moments here because um, as many of you saw, we're doing an outreach. Um, we had all the tables set up and for those of you who brought something thank you thank you so much for that but we are putting together um, just beautiful bags that we're going to be dropping off at Shore Memorial Hospital um, for the women on the maternity floor no matter what their story is no matter what it looks like we just want to bless those women and say we love you and happy February from your sisters right here at Imago Day. And so we just want to say, if maybe you didn't get to bring something, whatever you have, I believe that we just put it together and God multiplies it and he blesses this community in just incredible ways. So ushers, go ahead and just start taking up that offering. And again, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, as we were thinking about our third birthday, and the message that I really felt like I wanted to share for this special monumental um, marker here in Imago Day, I could not get out of my head that in June 2019, the Lord gave me a specific message, and that message was on confetti. And I thought, Lord, that's what I want to talk about again here in February 2021 is what exactly is confetti? I think it's something that symbolizes celebration. So I have a packet of confetti up here. And um, if you were here for that message in June 2019, get ready for 2.0 tonight. The theme is confetti, the message is different because I believe that we're living in different times and our seasons are in different times. And so God has a new word. He has a fresh word for us tonight. But I love confetti and I can guarantee that you love confetti too. Um, in fact, the definition of confetti is that it's nothing more than just small little bits of paper. And it's usually colored. As you can see here, it's, it's multicolored and it's thrown or it's dropped from the heights to enhance joy and happiness at a festive event. It's like, I think, a parade. They're throwing out confetti or at a wedding or at a New Year's Eve party. We think of confetti as a symbol of celebration. We think of confetti as a symbol of joy. Anytime you think of confetti, you buy confetti to celebrate something. You're celebrating something absolutely wonderful that is happening in your life. But have you ever stopped long enough to think about what confetti is? You know, confetti, all it is, is shredded paper. It's recycled paper. It's repurposed. A lot of confetti is on plan B of its life. You know, you don't go to manufacturing plants that make paper and their goal in life was to make paper that small. They make paper so that we can print on it. They make paper so that we can uh, write on it. And so this has been repurposed. It's not its original purpose. It's not its original plan. It's not actually even a full sheet of paper, but it's torn from a full sheet. See, Megan Taylor, she owns a company called All She Wrote Notes, and um, she's a hand letter. She does calligraphy as a profession, and her company is very successful. It's partnered with national retailers like Neiman Marcus or West Elm or Pottery Barn, Anthropology, just to name a few fun companies she's worked with. But I heard her share her story on a podcast um, about two years ago, and she said, I mess up 
writing all day long. As she's doing her calligraphy, as she's doing her handwriting, she realized she'd make a mistake. And so a letter or a word, it just doesn't look beautiful. It doesn't fit the perfection, the, the vision that was in, my, in mind. So she said she started turning all of her mistakes. She started taking all this beautiful paper she was um, writing on, and she started turning it into confetti by putting it through the paper shredder. And as she put it through the paper shredder, she realized how beautiful this shredded paper was. And she said, I quote, I take the scrap paper and I run it through the shredder and it makes the most beautiful confetti that you have ever seen. And she said, you can turn your messes in life, your mistakes, you can turn the hard parts of your life into confetti. You know, if you look at confetti, if you look at it up close, you realize that's exactly what it is. This is scrap paper. It's the mess up. It's the trash. It's the leftover. But it's just repackaged, and now it has a really cool job, and it's living a beautiful life. My question for those of you in this room or watching online, can you relate? Can you relate? You know, when I think of confetti, I think of bright colors. I think of neon. And maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're saying bright, joyful, happy colors. That does not describe my life. I want to propose to you that tonight that that is because Satan has tried to take, he has tried to steal, he has tried to kill, and he has tried to destroy and rob the very color out of your life. He has tried to rob the very joy out of your life, and he knows no better way to do that than to make you lose your identity, to make you lose vision on what is the very purpose of your life. And so my prayer is that tonight you will leave with a new perspective and that your brokenness can be turned into your greatest joy tonight. See, I know this is true because Psalms 30, 11, which I believe that every single word in the Bible is true. It is accurate. It is for us today. And it says this, God, you have turned my lament into dancing. There is a promise for you tonight that he can turn your mourning into dancing. Can you see that juxtaposition there? That the thing that is holding you down tonight, the thing that has made you cry, the thing that has made you weep could be the very thing that turns you spinning around and dancing in the halls of your home next year this time. It says that you turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. May I propose to you that whatever season you're in right now, it is just a season. It is just a season. It might be a season of mourning, but your season of dancing is coming. See, I believe that there are some of you tonight, including myself, and maybe you're just feeling disqualified for this race. Maybe life has stalled out and you're stuck. Maybe you don't feel fresh anymore. In fact, you feel stale. You feel like last season. You feel like you have already had your shelf life and you are expiring. You feel behind, like you should be farther along in life than where you are right now. Maybe you have forgotten who you are. Maybe you have been distancing yourself from who you know that you really are and what you're called to do. May I propose to you Psalms 103, 9 through 18 in the message, and it says this, God makes everything come out right. God makes 
everything come out right. It says he puts victims back on their feet. I think that many of us feel like we've lost our footing recently. And maybe you feel like you're toppling or you're actually down on the ground. It says he puts the victims back on their free feet. And I love this. He says he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Amen. Amen. Nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. For as high as the heavens is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. See, this is what I know, is that he takes all the broken things and he makes them beautiful. I can tell you that you can celebrate tonight that your mess can become your very message. As I was writing this message, um, even back in June 2019, but as I re-looked at this message um, for this month, I thought, who should I use in the Bible? And funny enough, it is one mess up after the next in the Bible. In fact, I brought, I want to show you what my Bible study is right now. I'm actually reading through First and Second Kings. And I wish I could show you this, but it was a little discouraging getting through First Kings. Because you can actually, I, I, I don't have a camera right here, but I put in the margin, um, I, I'm trying to find this one. I went, he did evil, he did evil, <laughs> he did evil, oh wait, good. And then I put like a happy face, the son did good. The son followed after God and he was blessed. Oh, thank God, we've got a good one in this crowd right here of all these kings. And then it goes back and then he did evil in the sight of God and destruction came on. And then his son did even worse. And then that son like was the most evil. And I'm like, this is just one Thing after the next. The Bible's full of messes. He uses them. In fact, I want to give you a little secret. The Bible says that all of us have sins and we all shall fall short of the glory of God. And so I want you to know that we are sitting in a room of sinners. We are sitting in the room of people that have messed up incredibly. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, not one of us would be here functioning or doing anything that is of value to humanity. But since I'm in 1 Kings, I could not help but to go to this specific um, in 1 Kings 19. It talks about the prophet Elijah. Elijah is a very famous, probably one of the most famous prophets in the Old Testament. And he had actually just completed performing an incredible miracle. Back then, um, they were, uh, it was dark times, evil times, and they worshiped a God named Baal. And, and what they did for this idol, that it was just mind baffling. But Elijah challenged them and he said, how about this? I set up an altar, you set up an altar, and we pray to our God to bring down fire on the altar. And let's see which God is really the real God. And so he goes, you go first, you Baal worshipers. And so they're over there and they're yelling. And Elijah, you guys have got to read this. He's having a little too much fun. He's like, I think you need to yell louder to Baal. He can't hear you. I don't see any fire coming down. And he's just tagging them on tagging them on. And then I'm telling you, he has so much fun because he knows who his God is and he knows how powerful his God is. And he said, I'm going to ask God to bring down fire on this altar, but why don't you start bringing me gallons of water? Gall like I want this to be such an impossible miracle that everyone in this country knows that this is the God who is the real God, the living God. Oh, he had fun with it. And sure enough, they're just putting water on this altar. And then he prays and God just sets that thing on fire. And of course, that nation comes to know the Lord. Powerful, powerful miracle, powerful miracle. I mean, that was an act of who is God. But then 1 Kings 19. Ahab was the 
was the king of that time, and he told Jezebel his wife. Jezebel was not even at the miracle. She was not even present for that moment. So Ahab had to go back and tell his wife how wonderful what happened. Says he told everything that Elijah had done. And then, just so you know, um, Elijah wound up killing all of the prophets, the false prophets. He is like, because we're not having any more bad influences in this country, so let's get rid of them. So he killed all the prophets with the sword. Verse 2 says, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, may the gods punish me. And do so severely if I don't make your life like the one of them by this time tomorrow. She gave him a death threat. After one of the greatest miracles of Elijah's life, an entire country had come to know who the one and living God was. One woman One woman who was not even present made a death threat. And verse 3 says, then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. You see, Elijah knew the power of God. He had just performed one of the greatest miracles that required incredible faith. He believed in God so much that he said, I could drench this altar with water and God's still going to show up. But God's not going to show up for that woman's death threat on my life. So here's what God wanted me to ask you tonight. Who's the Jezebel in your life? And what is he or she saying to you right now that's making you run? What voice are you listening to? What voice is playing in your head right now that is making you so anxious, that is making you so fearful that you are running and you are scared for your life? See, the next verse in 1 Kings 19 says, when he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there. He isolated himself. I need to be alone. I'm about to go have a pity party. But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness, and he sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough. Lord, take my life. A few verses before, he was praying that an entire country would come to know God, that they would know that he is the one true living God. And a few verses later, after seeing nothing but the power of God, after seeing nothing but the faithfulness of God, he says, I am done. I've had enough, and I just want you to take my life. He goes, for I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down and he fell asleep under that tree. So my question for you tonight is, where do you feel broken tonight? Where are you discouraged? Where are you sad? Where do you feel like you're messing it all up right now? I love that line, I'm no better than my ancestors. Where do you feel like, I said I would never be like my mom, and I'm just as bad as my mom right now. I said I would never marry someone like my dad. I'm married worse than my dad. I said I would never be a single mom, and here I am. Just take my life, I'm no better than where I came from. Maybe you find that you've failed miserably. You find yourself discouraged. You're afraid. You're running and you are wanting to die to end it all. Maybe those very words have come out of your mouth recently. 
This is what happens next. It says, suddenly an angel touched him. And the angel told him, get up and eat. And then he looked, and there at his head was a loaf of bread. It was baked over hot stones and a jug of water. And he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. Have you maybe tried something, and you thought, I'm just going to, yeah, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. And you're like, nope. I just don't have it still. I just don't have it. Verse 7 says, Then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time. Oh, God is in love with us. He is gracious. He knows what we need. And the angel of the Lord returns compassionately, graciously, not judgmental, not angry. And he touched him and he said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. Can I tell you something? Even when you want to end it all, God knows he's not your time to end it all because he has something for you on the other side of this. And that if you're still here, there is still purpose in your life. You may not feel it, but our feelings are real, but they're not true. They are not true. They are not telling you the truth. And so when God says your life is over, it's over. But if he has not said that, then that means there's a journey for you to still travel. There is a path for you to still get on and go, even though you just don't feel like it. Here's what I want to tell you, is that this journey called life is not easy. See, I want to tell you one of the billion reasons why I absolutely hate and detest um, advertising, marketing, uh, social media influencers in particular, is that they make their life appear to be a highlight reel of nothing more but straight bliss and happiness and nonstop emotional highs and love and laughter and from one high to the next high. And the real story is that it's all fake. It is all edited. It is all cropped. It is all professionally lit and filtered and staged. And that is not real life. And I want to tell you is that I think we are living in a society that is consuming an incredible amount of junk food. I think as the angel went and prepared a nutritious meal for Elijah and said, you need to eat because if you don't eat, this journey is going to be too hard for you. I think what we're doing is we're sitting here and we're eating uh, YouTube. We're eating Instagram. We're eating TikTok. We're Netflix binging. And that junk food diet does not allow you the nutrition to get on this journey called my real life and your real life. Let me tell you something. Your real life and my real life, it requires real nutrition. It requires real bread baked over stones, and it requires water, not juice, Coke, Pepsi, ginger ale. It requires training. It requires discipline. And for that, I want to say, good job, girlfriend, for being here tonight. Good job. Because you know what you're doing tonight? You've come to the feasting table of God and you've sang to him and said, God, I'm desperate for you. I'm not desperate for junk food, but I am desperate for what it's going to take me to accomplish this life, this purpose that you've given to me. And I'm taking this life serious. I'm taking the purpose and the plan of God serious over my life. So verse 8 says, he got up, he ate, And he drank. And then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights. That's a walk. And it says he went to Horeb, the mountain of God. He entered a cave there and he spent the night. 
I would encourage you to finish, how this, finish this chapter so you can see how it ends. But what I want to tell you is that the story ends, that God appears to Elijah in a powerful way on that mountain. And God and Elijah have a moment. They have an intimate moment. See, what I want to tell you is God knows what you need tonight. And I believe that Elijah, as he poured out everything he had in that miracle for that entire nation to see that God was the real God and that he was worthy of all of that nation's worship, that it left Elijah depleted. And what God needed was an intimate time with his Savior refilling him up and saying, Elijah, I love you for you, Elijah. See, I think in that moment that Elijah and God were having on that mountaintop, the Lord asked Elijah, why are you here, Elijah? Why are you in this place? What happened to you, Elijah? What is going on? And this was Elijah's response. 1 Kings 19, 14, he goes, I have been very zealous zealous for the Lord God of armies, he replied. I mean, I gave it all I got, God. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and they have killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left and they're looking for me to take my life. You know what? Everything Elijah just said, it was his feelings and it was not the truth. First of all, there was one woman that sent him a death threat. There was not everyone looking to take his life. The next thing is that you need to know, he said, I alone and left. Loneliness and isolation and feeling like you're the only one making a good decision. Like you're the only one trying to, do, to make um, better yourself or do anything. Can discourage you, can make you feel tired. But the truth was, he was not the only one. How do I know that? Well, because after that mountaintop experience that God and Elijah had, God said, now Here's your next steps. This is the next things I have planned for you. And ironically enough, at the end of this chapter, it ends with Elijah finding his very best friends, his ministry partner who refused to leave his side until he was taken up to heaven. He finds Elisha. In fact, it says that there was actually hundreds of people that did not bow down to Baal. But this is what I want you to know. We all have feelings, but they're not real. Oh, their feelings are real, but they're not truth. And so it is important to take our feelings to the Lord because he knows what we need. And this is what I want you to know is that he's your provider. We sing a song here and it says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. He's the way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. So maybe you don't feel that he's working. He's working. Maybe you don't see that he's working. He's working. That's what faith is. So I want to ask you, what is your story? What is your story? We all feel broken in our lives at certain times. We all feel discouraged. In fact, discouraged enough to say, I just want to die. I just wish that Jesus would come back like tonight, like right now. I'm done. We feel like Elijah sitting under a tree just praying to God to die. But I want to tell you tonight is that I believe God has brought this message to this um. February 3rd birthday of Imago Day to tell you that you are not a mess anymore, that you are confetti, that God has a plan for your life that is far greater than you can imagine right now. Let me repeat that. God has a plan for your life that is far greater than you can imagine right now.
See, Romans 8, 28 in the Passion Translates, Translation says this. We are convinced that every detail, every little detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. And I love this next line. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. Oh, you are his lover. He is your lover and he has a purpose over your life. See, you can just keep going like you've been going. You can feel like a fraud. You can keep hiding under some broom tree. Or tonight, you can make a leap of faith. See, I don't think that we were made to live small or sad. But I want to tell you, is that the confetti popper, it's in your hands. The confetti popper is in your hand. I need you to get this tonight. You can sit under a tree and you can pray to die or you can take confetti popper in your hands. You control your life. You control the confetti. I can't make you pull the trigger. I can't tell you. I cannot tell you to put your pain inside of this. Which way do I put this so it doesn't go on my face? Um, I cannot tell you to put your mistakes in here. I cannot tell you to put your disappointments in here. But what I can tell you is that you put everything through the paper shredder of God and you allow him. <laughs> Woo! You know, when I look down and I see this, that's my pain. It's your pain. It's your failures. It's where you've fallen short. It's your sin. It's bankruptcies. It's lost jobs. It's being fired. It's divorce. It's miscarriages. Can I tell you? Put it in the popper tonight. Put that pain there. And say, God, let's do this. I know you're working everything together. And at the end of my life, when I take my last breath, I want to look back and say, he did it. He did it. He took it all. All the junk. All the mess. All the times I fell short. He took it. And he did some really beautiful things. Even with me. Because can I tell you, the world's needs you to high-five the next person and to say, you can do it. Do you see, I'm, I'm turning 40 and I'm in a midlife crisis in case you can't tell. <laughs> but when I see Crystal on a Roman camera and just two years ago, all she wanted to do as a young adolescent, I'm talking 12, 13-year-old girl, was just be right next to me on the front row. And I said, oh, God, keep that girl close to me. Because I don't have it for much longer. But Crystal's got it. Oh, God, keep this next generation. Let us be a generation that says God is good, as we sang today. Let us be the generation that goes and says, yes. Life is hard, but God is greater. And that can say, yes, you're going to go through some really, really difficult times. And you're going to mess up really, really bad. But God still loves you. And if he did it for me, he's going to do it for you. In fact, can I tell you that Elisha, said as to Elijah said to his best friend Elisha I'm about to leave I'm about to go and and go to finally be in heaven when he's called me home but what can I give you before I go and Elisha said I want a double portion of the anointing I want a double portion 
see this next generation that's coming up, I want them to look at this generation and say, whatever they have, I want double that. Whatever Jesus they have, I want double that. I want you to know that making the right decisions sometimes cause you more pain than you signed up for. See, I think about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, we're not, we're not bowing down to anyone except Jesus Christ because he is our Savior and our Lord. And that put them into a den of some really hungry lions. But their God saved them. See, they didn't know how that was going to turn out. Sorry, they were put into a fiery furnace. Daniel was put into a lion's den. They all made good decisions that wound up in bad times. <laughs> and God's going to turn my mess of a message into confetti over your life. <laughs> Psalm 56, 8 says this. You've kept track of every toss and turn through sleepless nights. Each tear entered in your ledger, each ache written in your book. I like this version too, CSB, the Christian Standard Bible says, you yourself have recorded my wonderings. You put my tears in your bottle. Do you know who you are tonight? He has a bottle with your name on it. And every tear he's collecting. Do you know anyone that intimate in your life? The Bible says he knows how many hairs are on your head. Do you understand that there is someone that knows you so intimately that he's got a bottle with every tear you have shed in your life and he knows those tears. Do you know who you are here tonight? You are a Christ follower. You are a worshiper. You are Amago Day. Amago Day means that you are loved. Listen to me. You are loved. You are loved deeply. You are loved unconditionally. You are knowing. You are knowing by your heavenly father that he knows the number of hairs on your head right now. You are chosen. You are here tonight because he chose you to be here tonight. He wanted you to be sitting on your seat tonight to hear his love for you. I want you to know that you are seen. He sees you and have you not felt him tonight because his eyes is upon you tonight. You are accepted. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Once you believe that, everything in your life will change. Everything. I was at a store um, probably about a year ago and I saw a pillow and it had this beautiful butterfly on it. And at the bottom of the pillow, it said, just when the caterpillar thought the world was over, it became a butterfly. Just when that caterpillar thought the world was over, when it had no longer, it lost its identity as a caterpillar. And it was in a cocoon. And it did not know what its identity was. It was in an identity crisis. And just when he thought his life was over, its life just began for the first time. Might I say to you that some of you in here need to have it identity crisis. Your past needs to be your past. That is no longer who you are. It is no longer what identifies you. But you need to say, I don't know who I am because I am just learning that I am a Mago Day, that I am loved, known, chosen, seen, and accepted. 
the worship team can come back. I want to leave you with some takeaways tonight, and I'm going to go through them fast. Number one, God knows, and he's not shocked with the human condition. He is not shocked. He is not appalled. He is not shamed by what is happening. Because when he created man and woman, he knew we were going to mess this up big time. But he sees our mess as his beautiful children. He sees this mess as his confetti. And he knew this was going to happen. But he sent his one and only son into this world to save us and to rescue us. See, Romans 5, 9 says that God proves his love for us. And while we were still sinners, while we were still in our mess, Christ died for us. Oh, he was coming for us. Number two, you need to know this. This function cannot be equated with our standing before God. You are a daughter of God, period. No matter what you do, no matter what you don't do, you are still a daughter of God, period. Romans 8.35 says, who can separate us from the love of God? Who can separate us from the love of God? Can affliction or stress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I put this in here. Can a pandemic, can political madness, can racism, can loneliness, can boredom, can hopelessness? What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. Number three, sin does have consequences. There is pain in our world. There is pain in your life because of our decisions. There is brokenness. There is loss. And there's even death that follow our bad decisions. But number four, we do not have to feel alone in our sufferings. We've been given a cloud of witnesses that can identify with how messy life can be. See, I believe Hebrews 12, 1 says this. As for us, we have all these great witnesses. See, um, it says who encircle us like clouds. Remember how I was talking about like, we need to be the generation that encourages the next generation. We need to be the witnesses for the next generation to say you can do this. You have a cloud of witnesses the Bible talks about that's telling you you can do this. I just read about Elijah and Elisha. I believe that they are in the cloud of witnesses tonight that are saying, come on, Fusion women. Come on, Imago Day. We did this. You can do this, girlfriend. You've got this. And it says, but we have to let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin that we so easily fall into. And then we're going to be able to run this life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has already been marked out for us. If you were not here this past weekend in church, you need to listen to the message about wounds that pierce us. Because wounds that pierce us don't allow us to live in our identity and to run this race with freedom. Here's the next thing, last one. There is most certainly grace to be had. I believe that tonight we're, we're swimming in a sea of grace in this room. I heard someone say, no one can unscramble scrambled eggs except God. So maybe tomorrow morning as you're scrambling those eggs, and you think there's no way that these scrambled eggs can become unscrambled. You just think that's my life scrambled up. But once I give that mess back to God, oh, he understands and he has mercy. Hebrews 4, 16 says this, and I wanna end this verse. So now we come freely and boldly to where love is enthroned. Oh, I don't know about you, but those are beautiful words. That love is enthroned here tonight to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace, the grace that we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. We need grace here tonight. So, of course, as you leave tonight, you're getting a packet of confetti. I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna do with this confetti. This month, 
this year. Some of you still have not used your confetti from two years ago. Use it. But when you're tempted, and I would say you're going to use it this month because I know I'll be tempted by the end of this week to drown in your shame. When you're tempted just to want to sit under that tree and say, just take me. I just want to die. When you're tempted to say the pain is too much, the loneliness is too much, the isolation is too much, you're going to take out your bag of confetti and you are going to throw yourself a party and you're going to say in faith in Jesus name he's making all things beautiful he's taking my mess and he's making it beautiful he's taking my pain oh and God use it for your glory God you're going to take my disappointments oh God and use it use it for your glory God Give up. 